They fascinate, terrify, and occasionally kill. May 18, 1980, Mount St. Helens explodes. This is one of the most violent phenomena on Earth. The ash rises 15 miles into the sky. The blast moves at supersonic speed. The mud flows swallow people alive. Almost everybody who was inside did die. Leaving behind a ruined paradise. 25 miles out from the volcano, there just wasn't a living thing. Fortunately, St. Helens was in an unpopulated area. But what if another volcano erupts closer to a city? Like Seattle. Mount Rainier, 60 miles away, is overdue. It's definitely a question of when, not a question of if. And experts say when that day comes, tens of thousands could be killed. Now, using past disasters and the latest scientific predictions, we get an eyewitness look at what happens when an American volcano becomes a mega-disaster. Majestic Mount Rainier looms over Seattle, the icon of the pristine Pacific Northwest. Thousands of people live in the valleys just below Rainier. Its Indian name, Tahoma, alludes to a giant slumbering in a cave. But one morning, that giant might suddenly awake, and local residents will learn that they have been living under a time bomb. And when that day comes, the sky will rain fire and rock. When Rainier erupts, if it's an explosive type of an eruption, there would be a jet of gas, ash, and hot rock that would be hurled skywards for several hundred meters. As a massive plume churns the skies over Rainier, shattered rock, gas, and glass shards spread over the surface of the cone. And that uh, mixture would be turbulent, it would rip up uh, the snow and ice, mix with it, and cause extensive melting. The searing hot flow of gas and pumice charges down the flanks, mowing down 50-foot-tall trees as if they are blades of grass. The eruption pumps a deadly mixture of rock and natural glass particles into the sky. The expanding column chokes day into night. The black curtain of ash rises five miles into the air and is visible in Seattle, 60 miles away. Sparks ignite hundreds of forest fires. But ash isn't what presents the greatest danger, nor is it the eruption. 150,000 residents in the towns dotting the valley below are in grave danger from one of the least recognized of all the volcanic hazards. A creeping, deadly mud flow. Something like 35 square miles of snow and ice available for melting almost instantaneously should a, uh, an explosive pyroclastic eruption occur. 14,000 feet above the valley, this pyroclastic flow, searing streams of ash and pumice, reaches 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, melting a swath of snowpack. This is all it takes to start a disaster of biblical proportions. Boiling water funnels down chutes and churns through mud and debris. The hot flood shears off slabs of ice, picks up boulders, devours wet soil from the valley sides, growing in size, speed, and power as it heads toward the half dozen towns below the mountain. In the valleys, warning sirens wail, and residents jam the two-lane highway leading to safety. The slide has the consistency of wet concrete, concrete that can travel at nearly 40 miles per hour. Residents have to flee on foot. Those who can, run. Those who cannot, die.
With a deafening roar, the landslide slams into the Puyallup River Valley. As it rolls into the small town of Orting, the torrent of mud is nearly 30 feet high. It swallows homes, businesses, and schools. The river of mud and debris is as thick as quicksand, sucking victims under. The flood submerges 40 square miles of what was once a peaceful valley. The unstoppable sludge fills the towns of Puyallup, Enumclaw, and Kent, entombing tens of thousands of people. The torrent of mud thins out as it races through Tacoma, stopping only when it reaches the port of Seattle, 60 miles from Rainier. Damage to homes and commercial property exceeds $10 billion. This may seem like a nightmare scenario, but catastrophic eruptions are nothing new in this part of the country. In May 1980, Mount St. Helens, only 50 miles from Mount Rainier, exploded in an awe-inspiring display of nature's fury. The energy released equaled 24 megatons, making it 7,500 times more powerful than the atomic blast at Hiroshima. The eruption sliced 1,300 feet off the top of the mountain, carving out a crater one mile wide and 2,000 feet deep. It devastated more than 150 square miles of forest and recreation area, sending over 100 people to the hospital, leaving 57 dead. Both St. Helens and Rainier are part of the same mountain range. Called the Cascades, this range includes 13 active volcanoes and extends through the Pacific Northwest. Volcanoes in the Cascade Range erupt a very silica-rich, gas-rich kind of magma that tends to blow itself apart when magma reaches the surface. And so these so-called ring of fire volcanoes are very explosive when they erupt. Although both are part of the same ring of fire, Rainier stands much closer to a populated area, making it far more dangerous. St. Helens had its eruption. Now it is Mount Rainier's turn. We study the histories of volcanoes because they tend to have what you might call personalities. And what we're trying to develop is, a, say, a personality profile for, for the volcano. St. Helens has violently erupted over a dozen times in the last 4,000 years, each time changing its own shape dramatically. During that same time period, Rainier has erupted only four times. This creates a challenge for us because on the one hand, we have the potential for explosive and very dangerous eruptions, but on the other hand, we have a situation where they don't happen very often. But nature has designed Rainier to produce a much more lethal after effect. Those deadly mud flows, also known as lahars. Lahar is uh, one of the most dangerous phenomena that a volcano can produce. Lahar is a capability of carrying a very devastating uh, flood of, of dangerous material, abrasive material, and damaging material a long way from the volcano. With each past eruption, Mount Rainier has spread a thick deposit of mud over hundreds of square miles, leaving the landscape as flat as a tabletop. People now live on these deposits. It's nearly impossible to predict when Mount Rainier might erupt again. With Rainier in such close proximity to the densely populated Seattle region, Experts shudder at what the next explosive eruption might do. It's flat out going to happen someday. The history of the mountain is clear on that. When Rainier erupts, it will cut a swath of death and destruction through the region that could make St. Helens a mere historical footnote. Mount Rainier, just 60 miles from Seattle, is a ticking time bomb. 
A violent eruption at Rainier could shower Seattle with lethal ash and unleash a killer mud flow that submerges tens of thousands of people. The biggest natural disaster ever to strike the United States. And as with Mount St. Helens, death could come with little warning. In 1980, after a 123 years sleep, this 9,000 foot snow cone stirred to life. It began on March 20th, when a seismograph at the University of Washington registered the first signs of unrest, a 4.2 earthquake. These were primarily rock fracturing types of earthquakes. That is to say, the kind of earthquakes that are produced as molten rock tries to push its way up underneath a volcano. Usually, a swarm of small earthquakes gives scientists their first warning that a volcano is waking up. If you see a couple of earthquakes, then your eyebrow raises, and you say, OK, I'll pay attention to that a little bit more. On some occasions, that can be the beginning of a ramping upwards. Initially, the scientists who study volcanoes were thrilled to get a chance to see an eruption up close. Even though there are more than 1,500 active volcanoes in the world, including 70 in the United States, few geologists had experienced an explosive eruption. Well, that was a famous time. We haven't really had an eruption in the uh, continental United States since Mount Lassen in 1915, and who remembers that period of time? On March 27th, the pilot of a reconnaissance plane saw a black plume rise from St. Helens' vent a signal that the volcano was now fully awake. Just after dinner time, there was an eruption, and about an hour later, you know, we were packing our bags, getting ready to come up. Scientists from all over the United States gathered at the ramshackle headquarters of the Forest Service in Vancouver, Washington. Working in eight-hour shifts, the geologists watched and waited. And the steam explosions were quite visible. And on clear days, one could see these dark plumes of volcanic ash boiling up above the summit of Mount St. Helens. Before their eyes, cracks were forming on the rim of the crater. Landslide expert Barry Voigt hitched a helicopter ride to get a closer look. I was able to go over the top and, and look at the fracture patterns and try to do some photography. Meanwhile, the news media converged on nature's show with little regard for the danger that existed. St. Helens was quickly becoming Washington's top tourist attraction. To the geologists monitoring St. Helens, the picture she presented was puzzling, especially when they attempted to gather volcanic gases. Typically, a volcano that's getting to erupt, you see a high content of gas by various instrumental measurements, and we weren't seeing them. Equally perplexing was the pattern of the quakes. Typically, as molten rock pushes its way up under a volcano, earthquakes increase in frequency. Instead, at St. Helens, they were decreasing. We were beginning to think, oh my goodness, I hope this thing isn't going to go back to sleep. I mean, we were really worried that this might peter out and, and not produce an eruption. But on April 12th, a geologist noticed that the shape of St. Helens was changing. A bulge like a tumor distorted the north side of the mountain, cracking snow and ice above the timberline. This thing was moving out about two to three yards a day sideways, just an, inc an incredible rate. Amidst the confusion, Voigt was developing an ominous theory. My impressions at that time were that the cracks on the summit were, in my view, compatible to that um, preceding a very large landslide. He believed that a monster slide would soon release the pressure building on the inside, causing the volcano to blow. Having predicted such things, you, you want to be out of town. This impending monster blast threatened the sparsely populated area directly to the north of the volcano. Washington State Governor Dixie Lee Ray ordered property owners to evacuate. Meanwhile, geologists continued to monitor the swelling bulge. 
On the morning of May 17th, geologist Dave Johnston took over the job. Watching from Coldwater 2, his base camp on a ridge over five miles away, Johnston believed he would be safe. This would be a fatal mistake. On the morning of May 18th, at exactly 8.32 a.m., a 5.1 earthquake jolted the mountain. The north flank seemed to quiver like jello. The entire mass began to ripple and churn. Then, within a fraction of a second, the side of the volcano peeled off. A landslide of trees, rocks, ice, and dirt began to tumble downhill, gathering speed, sliding at more than 100 miles per hour. Four billion cubic yards of St. Helens, a gigantic cube one mile on each side, was on the move. Just a few seconds later, the north side of St. Helens exploded with an energy greater than 10 million tons of TNT. A hurricane of ash, gas, and rocks shot from the side of the mountain. The blast traveled at 300 feet per second, over 200 miles per hour. As it expanded, temperatures exceeded 500 degrees Fahrenheit. You have a violently exploded gas, plus some pumice-like particles, plus a material with a higher density, mixed in a churning, turbulent, hot cloud, boiling cloud that just moves out over the landscape, almost frictionless, uh, destroys almost everything in its path. Called a directed lateral blast, this is one of the most violent natural phenomena on Earth. Moments later, Dave Johnston became the first of St. Helens' victims. It ripped off the forest cover for the first uh, six miles or so, and then beyond that surface, it took every tree that existed in that forest and toppled it down in a direction pointing away from the direction that the blast was moving. And the blast kept moving for another 18 miles, killing every living thing in its path. And even then, it wasn't over. Less than an hour after the initial blast, St. Helens exploded vertically. Geologist Dan Miller, now driving towards St. Helens, was among the few to witness the event from the ground and survive. I looked over there into my shock and amazement there was this gigantic eruption column just heading up into the atmosphere about 45,000 feet and I watched it for a, a few seconds and pulled off the side of the road and was just stunned. The electrically charged ash and gas clashed causing lightning bolts to crack through the sky igniting hundreds of fires. Just as Barry Voigt had predicted, an avalanche of ice, trees, and rock tumbled over 15 miles down the valley until it reached Spirit Lake, forcing out all of the water. Tons of water surged up in an 850-foot tidal wave of destruction. Most of the water sloshed back, carrying with it an entire forest. For the next nine hours, the volcano continued to erupt expending eight times more energy than the largest nuclear bomb ever detonated. It was a pretty sobering event because I also realized that if the eruption had occurred one hour later, I would have been up there at Coldwater too. That's where I was headed. People living through the trauma did not know when the disaster would end, nor did they have any way of knowing that there was worse yet to come. The deadliest eruption in history was Tambora on an island in Indonesia in 1815. The volcano spewed out so much ash it lowered world temperatures, causing 92,000 people to die of starvation and disease. Mount Rainier will erupt again, and when it does, the explosion will inflict unimaginable destruction and death on those caught in its shadow. In 1980, Mount St. Helens gave us a foretaste of how crushing this catastrophe could be. On the morning of May 18th, three hours after Mount St. Helens started erupting, 
The clouds of ash were so thick they turned day into night in Yakima, Washington, 75 miles away. But the worst was not over. High above the valleys, a killer was being born. Melted snow and ice began trickling down the slopes of St. Helens. Water rushed through the debris and mud, bulking up as it moved, turning into a river of destruction. It was just absolutely astonishing. I thought I knew something about volcanoes, but it wasn't in my uh, imagination that a volcano could do this. The debris flow of crushed rock, ash, pumice, snow, and ice reached a height of 40 feet as it filled the valley. The mud flows merged, flooding the Toodle and Cowlitz River valleys, destroying over 200 homes and sweeping 20,000 trees out of one logging camp. The mass of trees, 600 feet wide and extending for 20 miles, jammed the Cowlitz River. The debris flow battered down 27 steel and concrete bridges. Rescue attempts could be made by helicopters only. If there was so much ash and dust in the air still that we got lost. It was uh, landscape of a different planet almost. By now, the ash belt extended over seven other states, posing a grave danger to aircraft. You know, an inch of fine ash is a lot. If it gets into the instruments, into the gauges, uh, basically can wreck an aircraft. Three days later, as the skies cleared, reality began to sink in. It was absolutely amazing for 25 miles out from the volcano. There just wasn't a living thing. 57 people had been killed, and 150 square miles had been obliterated by landslides. It's more than 10 times the area of Manhattan Island. It's a phenomenal thing, and uh, almost everybody who was inside did die. One quarter of the volume of St. Helens was gone. Rocks and debris now filled the valleys on the mountain's northeast side. I came away humbled by not having thought through uh, fully what kind of complexities could go on at that kind of volcano. Fortunately, St. Helens cut a swath of destruction through a relatively unpopulated area. But its first cousin, Mount Rainier, is close to Seattle. Thousands more lives could be lost when it erupts. It's one thing to watch a volcano in a remote uh, countryside um, erupt if nobody's at risk, but if people are at risk, then scientists want to be able to forecast it and to try to move people out of harm's way. If the wind is blowing in the direction of Seattle, over 100 million tons of ash could fall on the city, crippling local industries like Microsoft and endangering the health of thousands. The biggest danger remains the mud flows, which could kill tens of thousands, making this mega disaster the worst in U.S. history. The secret to protecting ourselves from such a catastrophe may lie in the smoldering slopes of Mount St. Helens. In the years following the eruption, geologists used her steaming crater as a living laboratory. By the mid-1980s, Technological advances had led geologists to believe they could forecast volcanic eruptions. I think the volcanologists had developed euphoria that we, we really had the, uh, the game nailed down. Then a tragedy occurred that would change their view of volcanoes forever. On November 13, 1985, Nevado del Ruiz, an ice-covered peak in the Colombian Andes, erupts. Compared to St. Helens, this eruption is small, but far more deadly. The blast melts the ice at the summit. Water gushes down the steep slopes. The rivulets turn into roaring torrents, picking up mud and debris. The mud flows soon grow into lahars, one of the most destructive and dangerous events in nature. Lahar is a uh, volcanic mud flow. The word mud flow itself is, doesn't quite convey the impression of this raging stream of 
material with the consistency of concrete and loaded with boulders the size of a room. The volume of material grows sixfold as it swallows debris and keeps on going. By the time the Lahar surges into the valley below, it is moving at 30 miles per hour with the force of a freight train. Without warning, the river of death slams into the Colombian town of Armero. And it knocks down the reinforced concrete buildings, and it picks up buildings and takes them away. And it scalds people because in some places the mud is warm because of the pumice that it contains. Within three hours, the mud flow killed 23,000 people. The volcano had turned on Mero into a cemetery. The disaster was a sobering object lesson for geologists in the United States. They suddenly realized that an unforeseen danger made Mount Rainier far deadlier than ever imagined. Then we had a rude awakening, and the rude awakening was uh, was uh, was our marrow. So if there are people living in an area that has been buried in the past by, let's say, a mud flow, then you know that those people are at risk for a subsequent mud flow that, that, that might develop. Our marrow was built on Lahar deposits. It wasn't a mystery that, that this could happen. And likewise, in the Cascades, there are communities that are built on Lahar deposits. There are at least seven towns in the paths of previous Lahars, including parts of the city of Tacoma. When Rainier blows, tens of thousands of Americans are at risk of being buried alive. Mount Rainier is a catastrophe waiting to happen. When it blows, tens of thousands of people could die. So much snow and ice cloaks its flanks that the volcano is an ideal breeding ground for the massive mudslides called lahars. The accumulation of one cubic kilometer of snow and ice on top of Mount Rainier is more than the total amount of snow and ice on all volcanoes in the Cascade Range. Rainier looms over a densely populated valley, making the human cost of such an event unimaginable. And what the experts fear most has happened before. In the valleys beneath Mount Rainier, there have been at least 60 massive mudslides. The most recent was only 500 years ago, mere seconds in geologic time. Geophysicist Carol Finn is in a race against time to understand these catastrophic lahars before they strike again. Finn is trying to determine which section of Rainier will generate the next deadly landslide. I use remote means to look inside the Earth. The best methods for looking inside volcanoes are magnetic methods and electrical methods, which tell you something about how well electrical current is transmitted through the rocks. In 1996, Finn used a helicopter to collect data in areas of Mount Rainier she couldn't reach by foot. The helicopter suspended a device called a bird over the summit. This bird sent electrical currents through the rock. On the west flank of Rainier, Finn discovered a problem. According to her data, the rock on that side had been altered. Electrical currents can travel easily through the rock in a volcano. It most likely means that the rock is altered. If you have a thick section of altered rock on steep slopes high in the volcano, that's an area that's going to be very susceptible to landslides because it's very unstable. Altered or weakened rock is created when sulfuric acid mixes with groundwater as it seeps through the rock, changing the mineral content of the rock into yellow clay, a recipe for disaster. What was once solid rock becomes this pretty crumbly stuff that you can actually take in your hands and break apart. An eruption at Rainier could dislodge these massive sections of unstable rock and turn them into a killer slide. It happened 5,600 years ago when the summit, interior, and east flank of Rainier collapsed, causing a gigantic mud flow called the Osceola. 
flow was so powerful, it surged for 70 miles, all the way through what is present-day Tacoma, stopping only when it plunged into Puget Sound. Geologists estimate that the Osceola covered 212 square miles. Of course, 5,600 years ago, the area was largely uninhabited. Today, nearly 200,000 people live on deposits from that mudslide. The Osceola probably removed most of the altered rock from the east flank of Rainier, making the likelihood of another slide on the east side of the volcano very low. The west flank, however, is now primed to go. It's only a matter of time until another eruption unleashes a catastrophic mud flow on the nearby communities. With that in mind, scientists have been working hand in hand with local emergency services to develop an evacuation plan for the communities at risk. At the heart of their hazard zone is the town of Ording and its nearly 4,500 residents. If a lahar came down the Puyallup River Valley, there would be no town of Ording. It would be destroyed. We use a 40-minute time frame for ording. We can't waste a lot of time contemplating what we might do. We have to get into action. The first sign that Rainier is ready to erupt would be an increase in earthquakes. Historically, just about every volcanic eruption has been accompanied by some kind of seismic unrest before it erupts. To get advance warning of an impending eruption, geologists have placed a network of seismometers in the area surrounding Rainier. We have a station right here that's about 200 meters away from the vent. We can track little earthquakes if they're happening in different places. A lot of our data streams are coming in in real time. We're able to look at them and see instantaneously what's happening at the volcano. Another sign that Rainier could be ready to blow are telltale changes in its shape, as occurred at Mount St. Helens. And we would look for some indication that perhaps it was swelling because new magma was moving up into the throat of the volcano and causing it to change in very subtle ways. Until recently, this deformation could only be measured by a geologist working on the summit of a volcano, a very hazardous proposition. And in the past, you were able to get to the top of, of a few places and, and stick in things by hand, fairly great risk. Rick Lahusen at the Cascades Volcano Observatory in Washington has developed a device called a spider that can measure changes in a volcano's shape without putting the volcanologist in danger. We want something that can reside out there a long time in a very hostile environment, can collect data, lay low, and then power up and send the data out when it's needed. We can remote release it off the helicopter sling cable and fly back out, and we're only in the kind of the most dangerous area for a minute or two. This spider contains a global positioning system and a digital camera. It's a very, very efficient package to get the equipment, the instrumentation, and sensors and telemetry right up close to the vent where we need them to get the most warning. The beauty of the spider is that it never sleeps. The camera can be there 24-7. Currently, 10 spiders are stationed on Mount Rainier. At the first sign that Rainier is turning restless, more will be deployed. These things would probably be sprinkled like confetti over the top of, of Mount Rainier, and then information would be telemetered back from them and would give us information on whether portions of the upper volcano had started to fail or not. Rainier is a high peak, over 14,000 feet tall, often obscured by cloud cover. If molten rock were to explode from its vent, people residing below might not even be aware of the danger. So Lahusen has invented another device, a fail-proof warning system called the Acoustic Flow Monitor. The Acoustic Flow Monitoring System can detect debris flows off volcanoes while they're in progress and broadcast a warning downstream to communities that are at risk. Six acoustic flow monitors, or AFMs, have been installed on Rainier at the heads of major river valleys. The AFMs are outfitted with a unique microphone that can detect the sound of a lahar as it rumbles over the ground. The sound is relayed to the warning center and triggers an alarm. If the warning sirens go off, 
the children of Orting know what to do. Do you run or do you walk when you go? Run. But the window for evacuation is so narrow that some residents may become trapped. East-west evacuation routes are very limited. So this is what is the biggest challenge for us to move 30,000 people out of this valley. But what happened in the past will surely happen again. Although scientists know Mount Rainier will erupt someday, they don't know how far the next killer mudslide will extend. Using geological records and the latest scientific theories, we will go inside a Mount Rainier eruption and experience firsthand an American volcano mega disaster. Volcanologists estimate that 15 to 20 volcanoes are erupting around the world at any given moment. The three countries that have the most active volcanoes are Indonesia, Japan, and the United States. At some point in the future, a volcano only 60 miles from Seattle will erupt. And when Mount Rainier blows, it will be a disaster of unimaginable proportions. If the scale of the eruption equals Mount St. Helens, tens of thousands of people now living in the valleys below will die. This doomsday is not only predicted, it can be accurately portrayed. It begins on a clear spring morning. The ground near Seattle rumbles to life. A seismometer stationed on Rainier picks up a tremor measuring 5.2 on the Richter scale. Its force is communicated via a real-time data stream to the operations room at the Cascade Volcano Observatory. These are real sharp pops or crackles, and they register like a, a big streak across the screen. Shrouded in clouds far up on the summit, Mount Rainier blows apart in a ferocious eruption. It would involve a jet of gas, ash, and hot blocks, which is uh, hurled skywards. The force of this vertical eruption equals 8,000 atomic bombs. A deadly plume of ash rises, expanding into a grotesquely huge mushroom cloud. You could get a plume that could rise uh, five or six miles, perhaps, into the air, uh, carrying uh, mixtures of gas and pumice. Hot rocks shoot up from the cone, a deadly mix of superheated gas and pumice hurtles down the mountain. Seven miles from the summit, the volcanic avalanche rips Longmire, the National Park's lodge, off its foundations, burning the building to the ground. This roaring, churning furnace surges through the park, carving out a 10-mile zone of death. The negatively charged ash combines with the positively charged gas, causing bolts of lightning to roll across the ground. Hell has come to Earth. In the valleys below, a turbulent hot stream savages the landscape, ripping off the forest cover all the way to the bottom of the slopes. The pyroclastic flow strips every tree bare, turning an entire forest into a pile of mangled matchsticks. At the summit, the eruption continues to pump out searing hot gas and pumice. The prevailing winds blow the toxic cloud toward Seattle, stopping traffic, wrecking machinery, and choking the lungs of residents. Satellite photos record a vertical column of ash that now reaches an altitude of 15 miles, well into the stratosphere. But all of this is merely the prelude. Now, hidden beneath the clouds of ash, the real disaster begins. Temperatures near the summit jump to over 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit, melting the ancient snowpack. There is only one direction for it to go down. The deadly flood begins. A debris slide so huge it dwarfs the one caused by St. Helens. And that uh, mixture would be turbulent. It would rip up uh, the snow and ice, mix with it, 
and cause extensive melting. Acid-rich waters churn through clay as rivers pour down the flanks. As the debris flow bulks up, it becomes an immense avalanche of destruction. In the Puyallup Valley, ashfall is so intense, the roofs of many buildings collapse. A thick blizzard of ash blows over the SeaTac airport and settles on the runways, jamming jet engines. On Rainier, the flood continues as meltwater shears off immense slabs of rock and slams down the mountain. Moving at 40 miles per hour, an unstoppable river of death 100 feet high surges through mountain gorges. Water and debris simultaneously gush, coming down four river systems. Tens of thousands of trees clog the rivers, battering down every bridge in their way. Debris flows are very, very efficient at traveling long distances. As they come out of the crater, would pass these AFM stations, and it will generate an alert as it goes by. In the valleys below, the acoustic flow monitors trigger sirens on loudspeakers. The town of Orting is in the direct path of the deadly slide. Orting is the biggest risk because it's close and it's, it's right up on the volcano. With sirens wailing, panic ensues. Traffic snarls the town's two-lane highway. Many escape on foot, but ash chokes their lungs. Some fall behind, losing their way and their lives. There's arrows in the streets that show you people here should move in this direction. The evacuation routes have been mapped. With only 40 minutes to reach high ground, emergency planners predict a third won't make it. You would run sideways and you get up the slopes of the hill so that you're away from the river valley itself and uh, as fast as possible. But the river of mud is still moving faster than any man can run. The raging torrent sweeps cars off the roads and gulfs entire communities over 40 square miles and buries alive thousands in the Puyallup Valley. The city of Tacoma, population 150,000, is next in its path. But evacuation is nearly impossible because of the thick ash that continues to spew from the throat of Mount Rainier. A tidal wave of sludge 15 feet high hits the interstate with the impact of wet cement. This deadly slide spreads over parts of Tacoma, stopping finally at Puget Sound. Mud deposits cover over 200 square miles, but still, it is not over. Rainier continues to erupt for eight more hours, pumping out tons of ash, destroying crops, snarling traffic, and choking the lungs of Seattle's two million plus residents. But the multi-billion dollar price tag is not the worst of the catastrophe. It will take rescue workers weeks just to calculate the death toll. A death toll officials fear could top 20,000. If this is true, a Mount Rainier eruption would rank as the worst natural disaster in U.S. history. The people who survive will be those who were quick enough to scramble onto high ground. For many, the difference between life and death will come down to one simple thing, awareness. And nearby, a warning still lurks. The turning point for people taking Lahar seriously was the eruption of Mount St. Helens because it brought this kind of volcanic activity from the realm of what I think to many people seem like speculation to reality. Mount St. Helens, the volcano that wreaked so much havoc in 1980, continues to smolder. A constant reminder that when man confronts the ominous specter of a volcanic eruption, the brute force of the volcano will always prevail.